Stephen Jennings, Rendeva CEO, right? Thanks so much for a wonderful Thank mind speak. Welcome. What were your impressions? <laughs> you uh, were pretty forthright. I mean, how did you feel that you... You know, I thought the audience was very engaged, yeah. very open-minded, and, and very supportive, because the issues that we're trying to deal with, the generic issues in the environment. It's not about us, it's about the entire environment. Why has it taken Stephen Jennings to deal with this situation than, rather than anyone else? You know, I think we have not done a good job until the last few months of explaining who we are, what we're doing, what is happening. And, and I think part of this is bringing these issues out into the open, um, not letting people who are breaking the law, even if they're powerful people, hide in the sh hiding in the shadows. And you could see that really resonated with people Absolutely. in the audience today. I mean, I, I, I haven't seen my audience take up something so strongly. And you made it, I mean, if I can just go through a few points you made, I mean, you were quite, uh, uh, you were quite binary in the way you looked at things. You said, you know, it, it can be successful, it can be an awful failure. And you, you call Burma, and, and on the other side you had Singapore. You see this as a tipping po point moment? I think there's tremendous parallels between what is happening in Africa now and what has happened in Asia over the last 50 years. And one of the huge lessons, and it's a lesson many people don't understand, is that success stories are vastly better performing than the failures. The, the stakes between winning and losing as a country in the emerging market transition, they're huge. And you, s that you seem to either do very well and modernise and sustain that modernisation, or be trapped at you know, per capita GDPs below $5,000. You know, if, if Kenya doesn't change its policy settings, if it doesn't improve the business climate and corruption, by definition, it is going to be trapped in that bottom bracket. And then the country's reputation suffers, investment flows suffers, and then it's harder to get back on the treadmill. And when you've got neighbours like Ethiopia growing yes. at 11%, more than twice as fast, and fast reforming countries like Rwanda, reputationally, Kenya's way behind. And at some point, it gets it becomes very hard to catch up again. And do you, but you obviously feel it's reversible at this moment in time, right? That yours is a call to action, as it were, a personal one, but also a general one. I like, I like the fact that you have a relatively advanced democracy. I like the fact you have a very free press. So, society is going to get more and more assertive, because that's who's losing. Yes. The costs imposed on society by these policy settings are extremely high. And the world is so transparent, Kenyans know why they're growing slowly and Ethiopia's gr growing rapidly. So th the pressure for change will mount and mount. So the only question w is when does that change happen and how does yes. it happen? We're in a 20 year project, so yeah. you know, we can afford to wait in a sense. Stephen, can I take you back? You know, you, you, you've been at the frontier for all these years, you know, Russia, when people probably laughed at the whole idea. Uh, you were describing uh, a similar th situation about Russians not washing, and I think that was a challenge sometimes that you find in Africa as well. Um, but I, you know, I'm just referring to that. But w w when you look at that frontier market experience, what took you there? What defines your success at the frontier? You know, I think I think you have to have a view on the the economic and political development. So you have to have a framework, it doesn't have to be very sophisticated, but at an intellectual level you have to have a lot of conviction that the countries will transition and progress. But then you have to, you have to be able to engage and enjoy engaging with the system and the society you're operating in. You really are at the coalface, you're in the yeah. nitty gritty, you're there for a long time. Yes. If you don't enjoy the environment, you simply can't function properly. So you need those two elements. So you went to Russia, then you've come to Africa. I think you accumulated this real estate that, we, that we're discussing in 2007, 2008, or was it later? From 2007 onwards. And you saw that, I mean, just from a, from a land transaction that's had tremendous economic value, hasn't it? Because if I go back to 2007, look at the prices, I mean, we've seen a big up, uplift across that portfolio. Yes. Which, right. Yeah, I came to Africa nearly 10 years ago. Um, we invested nearly 500 million of our own capital. Yes, we this is Renaissance. Renaissance Group. We, yeah. bought, we built the investment bank across the continent. 
we bought a lot of big stakes in banks. Yes. We were the largest shareholder in UPI, for example. That's right, I remember So we, that. we made a number of investments. So we were very clear on the macro thesis, but we were less clear on what the most interesting to way to play that, yes. that convergence was going to be. And the more time we've spent here, the clearer it is to me, it's this urban development yes. and this rising middle class and investment themes that leverage off that, mm. which are most interesting. But this is the first time you went into real estate on this scale, right? I mean, We've never done real estate. Yeah. So I mean, in Russia, we've done forestry, we've done very large scale agriculture. Consumer finance. Consumer finance. Ukraine, banking. you were in agriculture. We had over 200,000 hectares mm. of, of agricultural land in Ukraine we, mm. we found. But this was a, a different, a, a slightly different uh, diversion in a way in terms of your investment portfolio. Yeah, the details, you've got much faster population growth yeah. here. You've got much more rapid urbanization. You've got a very low quality installed uh, urban infrastructure. Yes. Which has to be replaced and upgraded. Yeah. And on top, in my view, your GDP growth is going to be sustained for much longer. Yes. So all those factors say do something to do with urbanization, the middle class. You know, pe people, whenever they compare Asia to Africa, they talk about a linear sort of trajectory of growth, whereas Africa has, you know, 54 countries. We just have to look at events in the last few months. Uh, you know, South Sudan, unfortunately, has fallen down, Burundi. How does an investor like yourself navigate that kind of volatility? Well, I think the similarities between Africa and Asia are much greater than people think. Yes. Asia benefits from a halo effect, which yeah. distorts perception, yeah. because there are many, many countries that have not been successful, despite the enormous opportunities in Africa and in, in Asia over the last 50 years. And there's quite a few Asian countries with lower per capita GDP than Nigeria, for example. Yes, that's so, the point that really struck me. Actually. And in my view, that is exactly what is going to happen in Africa. Mm. And I think that's the next very important message. Yeah. Africa rising, we yes. all understand that yes. narrative. But it's dependent on reform, modernization, and sustaining change. No one's, no one's got a guaranteed ticket to that game. Mm. And the danger in Kenya, and your policy settings aren't good, no. your, your ease of business ranking, your, your corruption ranking is really poor at the moment. If that doesn't change, your growth will stop. Do you think our, our government understand that, are invested with that thought? Well, the politicians will be swept away mm. if they don't respond mm. to the demands of the electorate. What I do know is the, the Kenyan, Kenyan society understands that you are underperforming relative to your neighbours. They basically understand why you're underperforming. They're, they're living in a sea of corruption. Um, and because you have a vibrant democracy, that is going to be transmitted through the, the, the electoral process. So the politicians, either this lot or the next lot, eventually they're going to respond to those demands. Stephen, just going into the, the particular story here, you know, if we can just recap a little bit of it, you made that investment in 2006, 2007. Um, you were saying you maybe did not talk about it sufficiently, uh, did not explain to people what you're doing. Just scope it out a little bit for us. You know, 4,000 acres, is it? Four it was 5,000. It's 5,000 hectares. 5,000 hectares. Slightly less now. Someone said it to me. It was the biggest planned urban development since Santon. Is that true? Although we have several others of the same scale now. They're, they're all uh, relatively the same. We have a number around 1,000 hectares. Okay. And so the urban development within our land holding is 1,000 hectares here. Okay. Then uh, in terms of uh, capital per project, how much capital are you, you know, are you going to be marshalling in order to make this happen, for example? We've invested over $100 million this in is, Tartu. This is capital that's gone that's in? That's our equity capital. Yeah. And we continue... That was in 2006, 2007? No, it's been right through right. because we've put in a lot of infrastructure yeah. now. So we, we continue to fund a lot of infrastructure yes. investment. Okay. So that 100 million goes in, and now something like Tartu, what would you say that would cost in terms to sort of develop the whole thing? Half a billion? Or in excess of half a billion. In excess of half a yeah. billion. It's a city for 80,000 people. Yeah. It's a, it's a 20 number. year plus project. Yes. So it's, it's very big, but you do it in stages. Mm. It has to be matched with demand and it has to be relevant 
to what the community wants in terms of real estate assets. Yes. So it, it ends up being phased. And looking across, because you're in all these sort of very exotic and interesting places, Lumumbashi, um, Accra, Abuja and Lagos, um, Lusaka. and Lusaka. And are you seeing, you know, the macro story that everyone's got, is it playing out in the same way? I mean, is the demand the same in each of these countries? Or would you say, I'm seeing much a bigger demand curve out of Lagos? Or how would you... The region is growing. Yeah. Almost everywhere. The pent-up demand for housing and high-quality urban infrastructure is absolutely massive. Yes. Just about everywhere. Yeah. Virtually no one is providing large-scale solutions. Yes. So when you create a new city environment, as soon as people see that it's real and it has credibility, yeah. the demand explodes. That dynamic we see everywhere. But there's a big difference between growing at 4% and 7 to 8%. There's a big difference now in per capita incomes in Nigeria and Kenya. And we start to see that showing up more and more. So, you know, one of the big issues for us going forward in terms of incremental investment, mm. where, where do we want to emphasize more and where do we want to emphasize less? Mm. Because the differences in Africa are going to be at least as great as the differences we saw in Asia. That's right. And that's the issue. That's the issue. For that's Kenya. an interesting point to make, right? I mean, so you've got to skew it in order to ride the wave, you're saying. You can't be 145th in the world yeah. in corruption mm. and grow quickly. It's and, and, and fall nine places in the last year. It simply is not going to happen. So the, the environment, until the environment changes, yes. you're, going to, you're going to be experiencing dim, diminishing growth as you did last year. You know, when you looked at, looked at those raw numbers, it was pretty brutal. But if you look at the story, if you look at the narrative, it's, it's a very different narrative. It's, it's like Nairobi's a hub, uh, very business friendly. Do you, you think that's a complete bifurcation? You know, narratives have a habit of flipping. Generalizations yeah. have a habit of flipping. So who would have thought Rwanda universally is perceived as a great place to do business? Yeah. Who would have thought Ethiopia is universally perceived as one of the fastest growing economies in the world and one of the best places in the world to do manufacturing? Yes. So it's, it's flipped positively. That it will flip negatively yes. in the same way here. When I talk to multinationals, when I talk to investors, mm. they're not happy with the, the environment here. But for obvious reasons. You're 135th in the world for ease of doing business. Mm. So everyone suffers the consequences of that. So if they can invest somewhere else, where the environment's much more favourable, they're starting to. And that image, that advantage, that regional hub that everyone believed in in Kenya, once that perception is lost, yeah. it's going to be very hard. It's not get impossible, it but it's much harder to get it back. And let, let, let me ask a couple of, a couple of final questions, if I may. You're smiling. These are going to be interesting. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm just, you know. Are you a New Zealander? Who are you, Stephen? How would you describe yourself? You know, no, I, would, I grew up in New Zealand. I was educated in New Zealand. My first career was in New Zealand. Yes, for the government. For the government and then in the private sector. So at heart, I'm very, very much a New Zealander. I have a New Zealand identity. Yeah. I find that very helpful um, from time to time, including now. <laughs> um, but I've, I very much enjoy being deeply immersed in frontier markets. Yes. I find it extremely stimulating, challenging and rewarding. And, it's, and if I didn't, you know, I, I wouldn't be doing this. And would you describe yourself as a risk taker? You know, risk, it's all about how you manage risk. Yes, um, don't we all know. Mm. You know, as I keep saying to people, you can go into the Australian outback without the right gear and without a guide, and it's very dangerous. Yes. If you go prepared properly, it's perfectly safe. So it's, it's about being equipped and having the experience and the commitment to manage the kinds of issues that will inevitably come up in frontier markets. And not blaming the environment, yes. but developing the skills to navigate. And, and the mentality to manage those issues on an ongoing basis. You called out two pretty well-known figures in this uh, in, our, in Kenya. I mean, Mr. Nyaga was the central bank governor. Vimal was on F in Forbes magazine recently. Uh, valuation of half a billion dollars, I think, was what they said. Um, 
when you look at the situation, do you think these guys haven't worked out that they were in a bubble before, but now we're in a globalized marketplace and they just haven't thought through the consequences of their actions viewed globally? You made this point, and yes. I, I just no, I think that is what is the, is it is it naive? Is they're it in an environment which, by definition, is very corrupt. Yes, where powerful people traditionally have been able to get away with dreadful things. Mm without being questioned or called to account. Society's changed. Yes. So just within Kenya, the world is much, much mm. more transparent and individuals are much more demanding. But the big mistake people make, and I saw this in Russia many yes. times, if you want to have a foot in the international markets, if you want to have a reputation, and if you want to be in the international legal system, yes. you can't behave inconsistently. Yeah. And you will get tripped up. And that's exactly what Mr. Shah has forgotten. Mm. He thinks he can behave in a very improper way here. Yes. He thinks he can try and extort us and then go out internationally and be the poster boy for investment and good mm. governance. Mm. Well, it, it, it's not sustainable to do that any longer, which is quite helpful. It is. Stephen, thank you so okay. much. Thank it you. was really a very, very powerful thank mind you. speak and it was really clear. I'm glad we caught up and I know it, I know you're going to be a tremendous success in this project. You know, I've seen you succeed from all those years ago and uh, I really, really commend you for Many coming thanks, out Erica. and taking a stance. Thank you for the opportunity. No, thank you.